As you know, we study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel, and we have some extra copies if you didn't bring one, and you'd like one to follow along, just raise your hand up real high, and uh, someone will be glad to drop one off at your row. You're all, anybody at all need a copy? One up here in the front on this side, maybe in the back. Okay, awesome, wonderful, great. Uh, so we're in a series of selected psalms. These are songs of revelation and response, as we've called them. Uh, God revealing things about himself he wants us to know, and then uh, the people of God responding to the God who reveals himself and, and what he wants us to know about him. So great models for us as we consider what does it mean to worship God, what does it mean to, to uh, respond to God in many different ways, and a uh, great uh, opportunity for us to learn about the character and the nature of God as well. So today, Psalm 40, if you want to turn there in your Bible or the Pew Bible that you were just given, or perhaps swipe on your device. We love to get you in the Word no matter what. And uh, we do go verse by verse through these. So I invite you to take a look at the text with me. And um, we'll be doing uh, this week a psalm, next week a psalm, Psalm 41. And then we'll begin a study of the book of Acts, which is the birth of the New Testament church. And uh, as we uh, start a new church over on the east side of Nashville, we thought that would be an appropriate study for us to kind of take a look at how this whole thing gets started and what was it all about at the beginning and, and uh, in what ways uh, is it still supposed to be just like that. In other ways, it's different. They didn't have air conditioning back then. I'm so glad we have it now. Can I get an amen? Uh, yes, so there are a couple things that are different, but then there are some things that we really need to hold fast to, and we're looking forward to digging into the book of Acts and studying that as well. But for now, Acts chapter 40, it begins with a superscription, which says, To the choir master, a psalm of David. There are 73 of the 150 psalms that are attributed or credited to David as the songwriter. This is the ancient King David of Israel. For the longest time, historians and archaeologists uh, sort of mocked uh, the Bible, said that there was no such person as David, there was no Davidic uh, dynasty in Israel, until, of, of course, um, as always happens, archaeology finally catches up with the Bible at some point. They're digging around over the dust and the dirt and the sand over there, and they find the, a little relief with the carving you know, scribbled on it. It says, the house of David, and which is, of course, a reference to the house or the dynasty of David. So we know, indeed, David was a real person, uh, likely the writer of this psalm. And in this first 41 psalms, which uh, are the book one of five books that are contained in the book of Psalms, we have five individual sections that are called book one, book two, book three, book four, and book five, oddly enough. And um, here we are at toward the end of book one, um, and we'll get uh, Psalm 41 and close it up uh, next week as we gather together. But this was to the choir master. So David, writing a song, he intended for it to be used by the people of God. So he gives it to the band leader, the band director, the choir master, if you will, of the people of God. And that's what they begin doing with this song. They sing this song. Well, what kind of a song is it? Well, we're going to see real quick. It's, um, it's, it's 17 verses. It has a bit of that revelation in it and a bit of that response in it. So we've got something to learn uh, from this psalm uh, on both counts. Now, remember, as we read it, Jesus of Nazareth in the first century said that the Old Testament finds its fulfillment in him. He made that bold claim. If that uh, isn't true, then he's a liar or he's a lunatic of some sort. If it is true, then he's the Lord himself, and really these psalms are pointing forward to and finding their fulfillment in Jesus. We'll make some nice connections between Jesus and Psalm 40 today because uh, it's quoted uh, a couple of times uh, and, um, and directly applied to Jesus in the New Testament book of Hebrews. But for now, let's begin with the, the beginning. Verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. He set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. I've got to stop there because there are certainly some comments that have to be made, right? How many of you think that waiting is probably one of the three worst things on the planet ever? Okay, I do too. I'm a microwave uh, child. I'm, I'm, I'm like always thinking that everything is too slow, uh, including God. I'm often saying, God, could you hurry up? I'm also often thinking those kinds of thoughts. Maybe you have as well. Um, I have learned over time, and after a master's degree in theology, I've finally learned that God is never in a hurry. Uh, this upsets me sometimes, but it doesn't upset him. 
He's never in a hurry. When you can raise the dead, you never have to be in a hurry. You can reverse the worst. So you don't have to be in a hurry when you can raise the dead, right? So the God of the Bible who can raise the dead isn't in a hurry. It's struggle. I have a struggle with it sometimes. I want him to be in a hurry to do some of the things I want him to do, the way I want him to do it, all that sort of thing. But for some reason, God just hasn't allowed himself to become my puppet dancing on a string like I kind of want him to be uh, sometimes when I'm honest about all of that. I waited patiently for the Lord is the beginning. Now, in the Latin version of our our Bibles. Um, um, this is um, this is this is called the expectans expectavi. It's the um, it is the expectantly I expected God to move or to act. Um, some of your translations will say I waited patiently for the Lord or uh, wait, waiting I waited for the Lord. It's it's said a couple different ways. Usually in Hebrew, when they want to really emphasize something as if you were supposed to take your yellow highlighter and highlight it so that you never forgot about it, they would say something twice. Same thing was true in Jesus' time where he says, verily, verily, I say unto you. That's the same thing as uh, him saying, amen, amen, I say unto you. The word amen simply means truly. And so, uh, so we hear some of our English translations will say, uh, Jesus saying, truly, truly, I say unto you, very good Jewish style. He's simply saying, highlight this. You can take this to the bank. Um, expectantly, you can expect God to move, to save, to, to hear your cry. And so he cried out uh, for the Lord. He waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me, God did, and he heard my cry. Look at all the stuff that God does here versus the one thing David does. As David looks back on his life, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. Now begins the list of things that God did. God inclined or hearkened to him or, or turned toward him, and God heard his cry. Does God owe that to us? No. Some people think that God owes that to us, but God does not owe that to us. What does God actually owe to us according to the Bible? You're not going to be greatly encouraged by this, but it's death and hell, okay? So um, some of you are going, wow, I'm so glad I came to church today. Isn't this awesome? Yeah. Um, so as a sinner, I'm a sinner, I've broken God's laws. And the wages of sin is death, is what the New Testament teaches me. The great news I have to tell you this morning is that you don't have to get what you deserve to get. And that's because of Jesus, to whom this psalm points forward to. Um, David says, I waited patiently on the Lord. He turned toward me, inclined to me, and he heard my cry. That's awesome news to be able to say that even though we don't deserve anything from God except death and hell because we we're rebels and living on a rebel planet, yet God turned toward us. Yet God hears our cry. How does he do that? I don't know. He's infinite. I'm finite. I can't explain it. Um, and by definition, as a finite person, you will never be able to understand an infinite God. If you're waiting till the day that you finally understand everything about God before you will believe in God, I'm here to tell you unequivocally, you will never believe in God. Why? Because you will never understand everything there is to understand about an infinite being. You cannot, he literally would fry your brain if you knew everything there was to know about God. It just would completely disintegrate you. That's how huge an image we're to get of the God of the Bible from the God of the Bible, who has inspired these ancient songs for us to learn about who he is, these songs of revelation and response. So we've learned that we can wait for the Lord. And of course, the fact is we all wait for a whole lot of things that are not God. Um, and this isn't just, by the way, chronological time, I'm waiting for God. It's 10 after 12. It's 10 after 12? Yeah, it's 10 after 12. Hurry up, God. You know, it's not just that. It's I'm, when, I'm, when it says I'm waiting for, I waited for the Lord, David is saying, I placed myself completely at, at, in God's service. So it's kind of like when you think about the server in Nashville that comes up to you. After they slip you their song demo and sing for you, then they begin to serve you and, and to ask you what you would like and would you like that well done or rare or whatever it is. 
and all that sort of thing. They wait, they serve you. They're there for you, right? right? So David is saying, Lord, I'm yours. I'm your servant. Uh, the Apostle Paul did something similar in the New Testament. Whenever in one of his uh, epistles, he opens it up by saying, I, Paul, an apostle, uh, and sometimes he'll say, and servant or slave, of the God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek word is doulos, slave. And it, what, he, what the Apostle Paul is delighting in is not that he's in some kind of prison or that he's, you know, he's, he has no freedom. Don't think of your view, your image of, of slavery in that way. This is the slave that is chosen to be with his master and is delighting in his master, much like in the Old Testament times, where there were servants in households that literally, at, when the year of Jubilee came up for them and they were allowed to go free, there were many of them that would go to their master and say, I don't want to go free. I want to remain yours. And there was this beautiful ceremony they would have where when that happened, the, the master of the household would take the servant to the front door of the house and literally it pierced the ear of the servant and because the, the servant would come to the master and say, pierce my ear, I'm yours forever. And they would do that. They would pierce the ear of that servant who chose to remain in the household uh, of their master. And they, they loved their master so much and their master treated them like family. And so Paul is just saying the same thing. God has treated me like family. He's treated me like one of his sons. Um, and, and I want to belong to him forever. And, uh, and I think David understood that, too, as well. He waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined, got inclined to him, heard his cry, drew him up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. Now, some of you, in verse 2, you look at that. Set your eyes on that real quick. Drew me up from the pit of destruction. Some of you know people who have led a very self-destructive lifestyle in one way or another. Maybe you're here today, and that's you. Maybe you are just bound up, tangled up in some kind of addiction that you just can't shake and you feel like you're on a very self-destructive path. And what David is reminding us of here is that this God, this God of the Bible, this redeeming, rescuing God of the Bible, is in the business of rescuing people that need rescue. Do you need to be rescued this morning? I hope, hope you understand that this God of the Bible is a rescuing, redeeming God. He does things like pull people up from the pit of destruction. And David is looking back in time. He's using the past tense verb. He drew me up. He lifted me out of the pit of destruction. What else? He lifted me out of the miry bog. Um, uh, in another life, I like to say sometimes, I was a musician. Some of you don't know this. Most of you don't know this. But we played this festival called Cornerstone. Anybody ever heard of Cornerstone? Say amen. Okay, a few of you have. So it rained from the beginning to the end of this festival, okay? So we're walking to the stage. Our, our playtime, our, the time we were supposed to play, perform was in the afternoon sometime or whatever. And we're literally walking through mud. Have you ever walked through mud and had your shoe taken from your foot? Okay, that's what happened to us. The miry bog got us, okay? David is saying, you lifted me out of the pit of destruction, okay? And you brought me out of the miry bog, the mud of the muck of my life that I had gotten so stuck in. And, con and in contrast to that, the end of verse 2, and you set my feet upon a rock. Isn't that different than standing in mud? Isn't that different than standing in the bottom of a pit? Um, you set my feet on a rock and you made my steps secure as he's talking about God doing these things. Um, he talks about God putting a new song in his mouth in verse 3 and a song of praise to our God and that many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. I love that. There are people in this room that need a new song. Some of you are singing the song of the curmudgeon. You're going through life as a curmudgeon. And if you know somebody that's a curmudgeon, do not raise your hand. They might see you raising your hand. If you're sitting next to a curmudgeon, do not raise your hand, okay? Don't elbow anybody either. Um, and especially your spouses, because you cannot be the Holy Spirit in their lives. It doesn't work. Um, but some of us need a new song, don't we, occasionally? I, I, I freely admit I need a new song occasionally. I, I, the world around me, um, the, the, the foolishness of my own life, uh, and the results and consequences of that, I need a new song. I need a new song often. And I love it that David uses that kind of imagery in this ancient Hebrew poetry. As a musician himself, he says, you gave me a new song. 
You put a new song in my heart. And as a matter of fact, it's a song of praise to our God. In other words, all of the muck and the mire, all of the pit of destruction, all that stuff has now turned completely around to where even though I did go through that very real pit of destruction and mud and muck, I actually can turn that now into praise. I can actually say God delivered me. And I can give God glory for that in spite. And many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. It has a missional result. Um, so if, the, if David is right, and I believe he is here, even the stuff that you might be going through right now that you're currently crying out to God for help with, please understand on the other side of that storm, on the other side of getting through it with that giant you're facing, on the other side of that mud field, um, when he proves himself faithful and lifts you up and is your salvation and is your redeemer God, glory can be had for God in this. And we need to be looking for it just like David was. Verse 4, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. That's a wonderful um, declaration of blessedness. Um, that's like saying happy is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Uh, but because we think of happiness in such shallow ways in our own culture, we think happiness depends on happenings. And so when our happenings aren't happening very well, we don't get happy. And so I want you to know this is a different kind of thing. This is a deep-seated joy in God, in trusting in who God is, in trusting that God controls the outcome no matter what the mud or the pit looks like right now. You trust in Him, and therefore you can even be joyful when you're doing things like Paul was doing, sitting in a deep, dark, damp dungeon tied to a wall, you can begin to sing God's praise in spite of all of that. And blessed is the man who doesn't turn to the proud. Uh, d blessed is the man who's, uh, t who doesn't turn to those who go astray after a lie. Um, let me just ask a simple question. Are there any lies being told in our culture currently? Anybody at all, please tell me. Okay, is it possible that lies abound? Yeah. Is it possible that theological lies abound? Yes. That's why I never want you to come in here and just download whatever I say. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures and see if what I'm saying is true or not. Um, um, don't be a mindless believer. Be a thinking person of faith. Okay? Um, and how do you know what to think about faith? Well, around here anyway, we have a high view of this book. And while we don't understand everything in it and we can't explain every question or answer every question you might have about it, or uh, because, honestly, we can't answer every question I have about it. So, But nonetheless, we keep running to it because we trust the God behind it. And while we may not be able to explain everything that he's doing, we trust his heart. And, uh, and, and, and so do that. Run to him. Uh, place your trust in him. Others may see that. And it may work out for God's glory. He's telling us the truth. The culture is telling us a lot of lies. The culture is telling us a lot of lies about God. The culture is telling us a lot of lies about ourselves. You've got to look like this to have a significant life. You've got to have this body shape to, have a, to, to be considered significant or beautiful. Uh, you've got to have this many strings of hit songs. This, you got to sell this many books. You've got to have this much money in your 401k to even begin to feel secure or significant in any way. Those are the lies that we... We're told lies every day about money, sex, and power. The three big sort of things, that, the categories that attract us the most. We're told lies about them all day long. Some of the lies are subtle. They'll just be laced in the middle of a little news report that somebody just kind of assumes that everybody ought to believe this, and so they say that. And, and it might be a report on finances. It might be some comments on sexuality. It might be some comments about social power or social justice or something. And in, in between all of it, you need to be a thinking person of faith and learn to discern. And don't turn to the ways of the proud or the ways of those who chase after lies. Like, this is what David is talking about, verse 5. You've multiplied, O oh Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. You've multiplied your thoughts to us. I love that. God is increasing the number of thoughts he has about Jim Thomas today. I'm stoked about that. I like that. I want God to be aware of what's going on in my life. Don't you as well. 
Some of you might be sitting here thinking, yeah, but God can't possibly be thinking about all of us, can he? He's infinite. Remember, let's go back to that argument. He's infinite. You're finite. You'll never understand how it's possible for an infinite God to actually think about every person on the planet or hear every person's prayers. We will be just like the Jim Carrey movie, thinking that if God's answering all the prayers, we're going we're gonna to go nuts trying to figure out how God can answer or hear all of our prayers. There's just not going to be it. We can't do that. He's infinite. We're finite. And, and yet this book is telling me that he indeed is multiplying his thoughts toward me, that none can compare with God. Verse 5, I will proclaim, the songwriter says, and tell of them, tell of what? God's thoughts toward us, God's wondrous deeds toward us, and yet they are more than can be told. God is so amazingly active in our lives, and David is saying, I can't even begin to tell you everything he's done in my life. Uh, the Apostle John sort of picked up on that when he, at the end of the Gospel of John, he says, Jesus began to teach and say and do a whole lot of things, and I don't even think all the books in the world could contain all of the amazing things that Jesus did. If we were to try and write them down, the books of the entire world wouldn't be able to hold it all. And that's the same thing David is saying right here. Verse 6 is what's quoted in Hebrews chapter 10. Um, the writer of Hebrews, we're not sure who it is, but the writer of Hebrews actually credits Jesus as quoting from Psalm 40 in his time while Jesus was on the earth. This is a thousand years later than this song would have been written, but Jesus quoted from Psalm 40 and claimed some of this to be completely fulfilled in who he is. In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted. As David is singing these lyrics, he's saying to God, Yahweh, he's saying, you're not really all that impressed with sacrifice and offerings. That is, with external religious activities. And he's going to go on to say, if the heart doesn't come along with it, it's just external religiosity. And so sacrificing animals is for naught. Um, um, giving offerings in, in the temple is for naught, or in the tabernacle is for naught, unless the heart comes along with it, is what he's saying. In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted. You have given me an open ear. That's an interesting thing for him to say. Um, uh, some think this is a, a reference back to that, that pierce my ear, Lord. I belong to you completely. Um, others think it might be a, a reference to you've, you've actually bored my ears open. This is fascinating to think about, isn't it? Um, a poetic way of saying, um, David saying to God, you've given me ears to hear. You've bored ears for me. You've bored out some holes in the side of my head so that I could actually hear you, God. That's fascinating to me. I um, increasingly am drawn to the mysteries of the human body. The, I talked a little bit about the human eye a week or two ago and how intricate it is and how, how amazing it is that it even works. Um, I talked about the nose. Some of you are around when I talked about the olfactory nerve endings inside your nose and how you can tell the difference between chocolate chips and smelly gym socks in a locker room or something and how amazing it is that all of that works. Do some study on the ear if you want your mind to be blown, okay? The ear is amazingly designed. And how many of you, let's do this. How many of you in this room, when uh, a friend of yours calls, and, they, you know, let's pretend they're calling me, and they go, Jim, and just by saying my name, I can actually tell, I'm going to say maybe a couple hundred, I can tell a couple hundred people uh, who they are just when they say they're just one one word how many of you think you've got that with with some no, some names some faces you can put a face with a voice pretty well right um, I'm pretty good about when I hear a singer on the radio or something like that. I can identify the singer I can I can say oh that's so and so pretty quick and the ear the human ear is pretty amazing the way it works together with your brain is is even more amazing and the fact that your brain can store that data and you can say, yeah, that's Bono singing, whoa, 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 you know, and you can, you can tell that, it's just awesome. And, and yet, when your grandma calls and goes, Jimmy, you know that that's not Bono. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what she, you're not sure what she's calling for, but you know who it is, and it only takes a little fraction of a second. That's awesome. So the Lord, who designed the ear and the eye and the nose, and I think it takes much more blind faith to believe that all happened by accident than that it was done by design. But this God that we're talking about, I digress, this God that we're talking about, 
He is the one who isn't so impressed with religious activities, but he's the one that actually opened up our ears to be able to hear from him. Um, verse 6, burn offering and sin offerings you have not required. Uh, and then I said, David goes on, behold, I've come in, in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. A lot of this uh, is quoted in Hebrews chapter 10 and of Jesus saying these kinds of things. It's amazing to me that he was pierced, just like the, you know, it's the image here is of, of, of God boring ears, piercing the side of it, had to make ears happen. Yet Jesus was pierced on the cross for me and for you. Um, he became one of us uh, so that we could become his in, more than, in, in, in terms more than just ownership, but relationship. Uh, to, that we could become his sons and daughters. That we could be forgiven our sins. He was pierced himself. And, um, and there was much um, ab about it that, that uh, makes him the ultimate lamb of God, the sacrifice, if you will, took God's wrath in our place. And burnt offerings and sin offerings, God's not required. He's not, he's not just into the external religious thing if the heart doesn't come with it. God so believed that himself that he got up out of the comforts of heaven and came down here because his heart was driven by love for sinners like me. And he allowed himself to be pierced for me to take the wrath of God in my place. And he laid down his life so that the price for my sins could be paid for once and for all so that I could come up here and, and just be able to tell you the same kind of thing and remind you that he's done this for you. Um, I love this. I, I've come in the scroll of the book. It's written of me. I delight to do your will. Oh, my God, your law is within my heart. Verse 8 is, man, when I read that, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I read verse 8 and I go, I'm not sure I always delight to do his will. And if you're honest, you know, if we were all just being honest right here, right now, we'd have to admit that we aren't always delighting to do his will. We aren't always trying to live up this prayer that we all pray at least once in our life. Hallowed be thy. We aren't all living hallowed be thy. We aren't all wanting his kingdom to come, his will be done in our lives because there's sometimes we want our kingdom to come and our will to be done. And we want to take his place and that's, that's our sin nature that, that surfaces. But I love in this song that David expresses this and it's most fulfilled and only really fulfilled in the person and work and the life of Jesus Christ. The only one who came and lived a sinless life, which makes him the only one qualified to get up on the cross and die in my place. He didn't die for his sins. He didn't have any. He died for my sins. And he died for your sins. And that's what made him uh, qualified to die for me and not for his own sins. That's beautiful. I delight to do your will. I want to be like Jesus, so I want to say that too. I delight to do your will, oh my God. Your law is within my heart. That's a, certainly a secret of wanting to delight in God is to be familiar with his law, to be familiar with his word. And that's why we study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel. Now, um, he also has a missional aspect to this psalm. Look at verse 9. I've told the glad news of deliverance. So he's, he's talking about God in the great congregation. Behold, I've not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I've not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I've spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I've not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. And when we gather together as the church, that's what I hope we're doing, reminding each other of God's greatness, of God's faithfulness, of God's mercy and his grace on offer to sinners such as we are. I know that some of you grew up in some kind of dark sort of streams of the church where legalism was all they talked about. And, and the idea of being a Christian was just to be a, just become some kind of a moral policeman handing out tickets to everybody that does something wrong. Of course, you've never given yourself a ticket. You probably deserve as many as you handed out. But they're just taught to just sort of browbeat everybody with guilt and shame. Instead of that, Psalm 40 reminds us and the entire Bible reminds us that we have good news to share with other people. And that good news is sinners though we are, the real God who is really there, the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament is actually a redeeming and a rescuing God who comes on the run for prodigals who have run the other way. And when they, just when they have finally run out of themselves, just when they've finally come to the place where they realize their spiritual poverty, it's just at that moment that the good news of the gospel really begins to ring true when we see that we have nothing to offer, that we're out of it. We just have to completely throw ourselves uh, at God's mercy and at God's, uh, at God's feet. 
Um, I've told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. I haven't restrained my lips. I've talked about your deliverance within my heart. I haven't hidden it there. I've talked about it. I've spoken about your faithfulness. All that's beautiful from verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> As for you, verse 11, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. Excuse me one second. It gets a little dry up here sometimes, you know. So forgive my bottle of water. Um, <clears throat> For evils have encompassed me, is a little lament here, very honest, beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me. I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. In some ways, this foreshadows Jesus. Um, um, Jesus didn't have any of his own iniquities. But on the cross, what happened was Jesus took on the sin of the world and literally died smothered in borrowed sins, okay? And then his body was laid in a borrowed grave that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. So he died in my place, died, took my sins on himself, died and was buried in a borrowed grave, right? And then, I love it, three days later, God did to Jesus' grave what he's going to do to my grave one day and to your grave one day. He busted it wide open and Jesus came out of the tomb alive again. Resurrection is central to the Christian faith. And so, but be pleased to deliver me, verse 13. Oh, make haste to help me, fulfilled ultimately in the resurrection of Jesus. You bet. Let those be put to shame who disappointed altogether, who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. There were people around the cross that were openly mocking Jesus delighting in his death. The religious leadership of his day, oddly, not the prostitutes and the ne'er-do-wells of his day, but the self-righteous religious leadership of his day, circling the cross, really happy to see Jesus hanging on the cross, mocking him openly, right? So read this. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha, mocking, scoffing, and here's David foreshadowing, I think, all of that years and years ahead of time. Verse 16 and 17. But may all who seek you, he sings, and this is a, he turns away from his lament, and now he, 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 it's almost like a benediction. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. Now you got to spend just a moment on each of those phrases. May all who seek you reminds us that not all seek him. Oh, come on, we're all basically good. We live in the South. We're all basically good, aren't we? No, some of us don't seek him and don't care to seek him. There are some of us that have sold millions of books because they don't seek him. And they openly say, aha, aha, and mock God and mock those who believe in God. So there are some people that do not seek God and don't want God to be God. Don't even want there to be a God. And they shall have what they want. Sadly, they shall have what they want. What could be more fair than that? God giving them exactly what they want. A life on into eternity, forever removed from God. That's what they want. God will give it to them. How about you? What do you want? Let all those who seek you, is the benediction, kind of sort of as he, he's saying it, saying it to the Lord, but he's, it's, it's really for our benefit to hear. May all who seek God rejoice and be glad in God. May those who love God's salvation say continually, great is the Lord. That's really wonderful to hear that said. Let's say it together. Great is the Lord. One more time. Great is the Lord. A little gusto. Great is the Lord. That's awesome. You know, it's kind of fun. The kids get to do that every Sunday. They go down to Miss Jamie's room, and they're, Jamie has them say all these things all the time. I don't do that much up here. We're not, give me a J! Yeah, we're, 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 not, we're not really much into the Jesus cheer thing up here. Um, we're a little too sophisticated, you know. So, But it's really nice to hear God's people say it one more time. Great is the Lord. Okay, that's really nice to hear and to gather together and to remind ourselves that it's not us that's great. You know, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people love me. You know, it's not that. It's great is the Lord. And, and so what's happening to us is we're now moving away from self-worship 
and, and, and sort of, you know, this, this sort of, the, the way things are in our world right now, people have a spirituality, but it's, it's completely devoid of any object of faith. And now what we have is a biblical faith, which we're encouraged here in chapter 40, to trust in the Lord, who is great. And isn't that awesome? Because really what you've been longing for, you may or may not know this, but what you and I, what we've always been longing for is a real God, not a God of our own imagination. Not just God as you imagine God to be, because I, I got to tell you, the God that you imagine to be is going to like what you like and hate what you hate. And that means he's not really God at all. The God of your imagination is not going to be able to save you. Why? Because he's not going to be big enough to save you. The God of your imagination, by the way, listen to me. Believe me on this one, okay? The God of your imagination actually is not even going to be able to forgive you. Why? Because we constantly, um, uh, we're constantly filled with sort of a self-destructive attitude toward our, you know, to, to our own selves. We won't even forgive ourselves. And yet, what I, the great news I have to tell you is that the God of the Bible is so eager to forgive you, he's like the prodigal son's father. He's watching from the window, looking in the distance, just waiting to see us coming home, turned around finally, coming home, just one turn, one step toward him, and he comes running out of the house toward us jumps all over us, throws a robe around us, puts a ring on our finger, sandals on our feet, and throws a huge party to welcome us home. That's the kind of God I want to believe in. I don't know about you. More eager to forgive me than I am to be forgiven. That's the good news I have to tell you about the God of the Bible, both the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. That's the kind of God this God is. And we see it here in the Old Testament in Psalm 40, and David is talking about it. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. And we have reason to say that because his salvation, we love it. Why do we love his salvation? Well, partly because it's not our salvation. It's not the one I came up with. You know what the salvation I would come up with looks like? Okay, it looks more like karma. It looks more like balance out the moral scales, be good enough, and if your good deeds outweigh your evil deeds, okay, and you come to the village chapel, okay, now you get in, okay. Oh, wait, if you tithe, even more so, you know. It, that's the kind of religion we would put together ourselves. It's all about performance-based religion. And the Christian faith is not that. It is grace, and that's what makes it different from every other religious system on the planet. It's not about what you do or I do. It's about what Christ has done. And so we place our hope and our faith and confidence in him and in him alone. So we love his salvation and we say things like, great is the Lord. And then verse 17, as for me, I'm poor and needy. I love this, the way he gets right back to this. And notice how this whole psalm turns right back around. It's so honest. I love this about David. He's so honest. As for me, I'm poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. He states the reality of his condition. He may be living in the desert. We don't know what precipitated this song. He may be out in the de uh, Judean desert right now running from Absalom, his son, who wanted to kill him. He might be running from King Saul, his predecessor, who wanted to kill him. He might be running from the Philistines who wanted to kill him. A lot of people after this guy. And he might be out in the desert and poor and needy, meaning I got nothing to eat, I got no money, I don't have any coin, I don't have anything. I'm hiding out in a cave with 400 guys that are, that are sort of my army, and that's it. We're just a band of runaways, you know? And that might be what he was referring to. I don't know. But the Lord takes thought of me. I love that. That's beautiful. No matter what condition you're in right now, the Lord takes thought for you. He's multiplying his thoughts about you. That's what this psalm teaches us. Then he declares to God, you are my help and you are my deliverer. And then I love this. Remember how he opened the psalm? I waited for the Lord. How does he end it? Don't delay, Lord. <laughs> it's like full circle. It comes right back around. I'm still here waiting for you, Lord. I love that honesty. This is our Bible, man. This is the honesty of our Bible. Look, no matter where you're at in your spiritual journey right now, there's a psalm that speaks to you. Right where you're at, your condition, and that's why I love the Psalms. They not only speak to us, they speak for us. They give voice to the condition of our lives and our hearts. 
And so it's proper and right that we study these, and it's proper and right that we see that for a long, long time, at least 3,000 years, all the way back to the writing of this song, people have been reminding themselves to wait on the Lord, to be his servants, no matter how dry the desert is, no matter how big the giant is, no matter how rough the storm is, to trust and hope and put our confidence in the God who is there. All right, so rightly remembering is good for us. It redeems our rejoicing in God. As Matt Chandler, uh, pastor at the Village Church, not Village Chapel, but Village Church down in Dallas, Texas said. So hyper speed, we're going to warp speed through these little reminders from Psalm 40. Look backward on the mighty deeds of God in the past and remember what God has done. Secondly, look upward in faith believing. Authentic faith means returning to God again and again. Verses 4 uh, through 6 remind us of that. Number three, look inward, setting your heart's affection on God. We see that in verses 7 and 8 here. And that's real faith. It issues not in lifeless religion and sacrificing and, and, and putting money in the offering without our hearts being involved. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. So around here at the Village Chapel, we say no grumpy giving. We're actually going to tell you if you're going to be grumpy about putting something in that box, keep it. Because it's really going to be of no eternal value to you. But joy-based giving, oh yeah, man, the Lord loves hilarious joy-based giving. That's a proper, proper way to look at it all. Um, I love that. Turn our heart's affection toward him. Four, look outward and testify to others. Verses 9 through 11, declare the Lord's righteousness, his faithfulness, share the gospel with others, talk about God. Be, don't compartmentalize your faith. Tell others. There are so many people out there are so eager to find out what does it take to get, to, to get our guilt and shame turn, turned off. Tell him. He's come. The Redeemer has come, and, he, and he's, he's come for you. You know, tell him that. Five, look around and notice the brokenness of your fallen world. And that's that lament in verses 12 through 15. It's amazing. And is our world broken? Somebody tell me. Yeah. Is our world broken right now? Is it unraveling in some ways? Yeah, pretty weird right now. Is there injustice all around? Yeah. There's a lot of injustice. Is there violence, domestic violence, and all, violence of all? Yes. Is there inequity in many different areas? Yes. We need help. And we need outside help. That's why we turn to the God of the Bible uh, and to Christ who has come for us to rescue us. Six, look forward to God's ultimate salvation, which is uh, inferred in verses 16 and 17 as he cries out, the, as, as the songwriter cries out to God uh, and, and says how much he loves God's salvation and says, great is the Lord, trusting and hoping in God. All right. Uh, N.T. Wright said, the only way to make sure we mount up with wings as eagles is to make sure it's really the Lord we're waiting on. Uh, you know he's referring to, most of you, Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. The only way to know that you're waiting on the Lord, as he says, <clears throat> the only way to be sure you'll mount up with wings as eagles is to wait on the Lord, and that's so true. You were actually designed and created by God with eternity in your heart, the book of Ecclesiastes tells us. So when Lewis says, I find, if I find in myself a desire no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world, and that's the case. You know anybody that's chronically dissatisfied, or are you chronically dissatisfied? It might be because you're waiting on your job or you're waiting on a relationship or you're waiting on money, sex, or power. It might be that you're waiting and serving something that isn't God. Now, there are a lot of good things in our lives that we're supposed to treasure, and they're, 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 they're still good things. But that doesn't mean they were meant to be the center. It doesn't mean that we're to wait on them in the same way that we're called here and encouraged here to wait on God. And I'll close with this quote from Sam Storms. God's most glorified in us when our knowledge and experience of him ignite a forest fire of joy that consumes all competing pleasures and he alone becomes the treasure that we prize. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. You are the treasure we prize. You are both our greatest need and the answer to our greatest need because you came for us when we were running the other way when we wouldn't even admit our need, you came for us. So Holy Spirit, move on all of us, I pray. Um, open our eyes. Give to us the faith that leads to repentance. 
and stir us awake spiritually that we might hear and see. Give us ears and eyes, Lord, that we might hear and see the beauty of the gospel of grace through Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray, amen.